Church, open your Bibles. We will be back in the book of John, the Gospel of John again today. And if you remember, we are making our way for the next uh, number of weeks through one of the longest speeches that Jesus gives. It's called the Upper Room Discourse. Uh, Jesus takes his disciples into an upper room. It's borrowed from some folks who give it to him. And that's where he has the Passover meal, and it's on the eve right before the day of his death. Today, what we're going to find is there's a traitor in our midst. The most famous American traitor of all time is Benedict Arnold. I think I maybe learned about Benedict Arnold way back in high school in the unit on the American Revolution. But honestly, I'm not sure I knew all the details. I had to go look that up again this week. And Maybe you're in that camp, you know, you're like, I'm not quite sure who Benedict Arnold even is, and so let me pull the cobwebs out of American history for you. Benedict Arnold was a contemporary of George Washington. He was actually a very skilled and famous military commander, and during the American Revolutionary War, he actually won a battle at Fort Ticonderoga, brought that back for the Americans. He also won a battle at Saratoga, which was a decisive battle, and many consider that maybe the turning spot of the war. So he's very accomplished. The problem with him was that he had feedback. No, uh, the problem with him was that uh, he could not get over the fact that he had not been given uh, accolades for the uh, accomplishments he had. He had had such big times of accomplishments but he was not given uh, what he thought was his due. As a result of that, he felt humiliated, and he made a pact with the British in order to uh, sell them the land at West Point, which was a very favored piece of land and probably would have given them a leg up in the war, and they would give him a big sum of money. He did not accomplish that. That uh, trade never happened because there was a spy who was found out And the spy gave him up and gave up his plan. So in the middle of the Revolutionary War, as he's been the successful commander, he switches sides and he starts leading battles now against America and against the Americans. And so he goes down in history as synonymous with traitor, at least in the English language in America, as the height of what a traitor looks like, Benedict Arnold. In today's story, I'm going to argue that we have a traitor that is even at a higher level. Maybe the biggest traitor of all time is in our story today, and you know who I'm talking about. That traitor is Judas Iscariot. Here's what you don't see coming, and I'm going to tilt the hand right before we read the passage today. There is another person at the table that night, eating the same meal, hearing the same speech from Jesus, who also has a colossal failure of faith. Two people have a failure that night. One is going to end very terribly. The other is going to be a little minor blip in his life. It doesn't feel like that at the moment. But let's read and we'll find out about the two men that night that had a failure of faith. John chapter 13, and uh, this morning I'm starting in verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one uh, one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus had loved, was reclining at the table at, at Jesus' side, So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, by the way, that's probably John himself, and he's speaking of himself in third person because he's at the table at that moment. So so that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now now no one at the table knew why Jesus said this this to him. 
Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast. Or others thought, give him something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I've said to the Jews, so I now say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but uh, you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. If you remember last week, we found out Jesus had washed the feet of the disciples and he washed the feet of Judas Iscariot, even though he knew Judas was about to betray him. We also remember that night that Jesus is washing the feet and Peter's falling all over himself saying, no, you can't wash my feet. You know, this is below your station. You you know, you're ready to be the king. You can't be doing things like this and embarrassing all of us. And after that foot washing episode is over, there's something that happens that takes a dark turn in the room. And of course, Jesus declares, one of you is a traitor. You can imagine that night at dinner, you know, the air leaves the room, everybody stops eating and just looks around at each other with a startled look on their eyes. Nobody quite knows what to do because they had not seen this moment coming. We don't regularly think that that night there's a traitor, but there's also somebody else in the room that's going to have a moment of a failure of their faith. And of course, that's going to happen with Peter. Judas is going to be the denier, or excuse me, the traitor, Peter is going to be the denier, but both of them are going to have a problem that night. And what I'd like to do in the sermon this morning is compare and contrast those two because they have a lot of things in common, a few things that are also uh, differences, but I'd like to compare and contrast Judas with Peter this morning in order for us to get a handle on where Jesus is going with this passage. Both of them have a failure of faith. Let's find out some similarities and differences between Judas and Peter. Here goes. First of all, both of them are what I call on the inside. And by this, I mean that both disciples are one of the 12. Both of them have been invited to follow Jesus and have responded yes. Both of them have lived with Jesus. They've followed Jesus. They've slept in the same camp with Jesus, eaten the same food as Jesus. Both of them have traveled to different towns with Jesus. They've watched him teach. They've watched him heal. They've watched him, you know, just have mastery, really, over all the things that he's doing. Both of them also have special assignments. Uh, In fact, Peter was given the special assignment to walk on water. You remember that one. Peter's also given the special assignment of being able to go and watch Jesus transfigured on the mountain. Jesus turns like a dazzling white, and Peter's one of the ones that has the assignment of going and watching that all happen. In addition to that, Judas has a special assignment. He is given charge over the treasury. He's the treasurer of the group, and he's the guy that looks after the money. But we get indications long before this night that there's some problems with the way that, Peter, or that Judas goes about uh, handling that money. I'm in John chapter 12, verse 6, and let me paint the story before I read that. Uh, they are at a, a home, and there's a woman that comes in, and she, so in love with Jesus, so forgiven by Jesus, she takes a very expensive perfume. She pours it on Jesus' feet while she continues to kiss him and actually wipe his body or his feet with her hair. And Judas is the one that says, hey, hold on just a second. That's really expensive perfume. We could have sold that for the poor. And everybody around probably stood back and said, well, you know, that's a good point. Give a a gold star to Judas. I mean, you know, hey, he's a wise keeper of the money. That's a very astute. 
But this is what we're told in John chapter 12. Here it is. At this point, he, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And so we get this indication that all's not right with Judas long before this moment, and he is embezzling money. He's the guy that's you know, taking stuff. Here's what I want you to hear. It's possible to be near greatness. It's possible to see the hand of God. It's possible to see the things that are so important from God's perspective and for people to miss those. Being religious is not what counts. Knowing God is. Following God is what is. And obeying God is what is. And it's possible to be around all of those things and yet not be an individual who's really a follower of Jesus. Jesus even says this much. Matthew chapter 7, here it is. Do you have the next one for me? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, I cannot imagine that. Individuals who are even casting out demons in Jesus' name and yet don't know him, that's what we're getting indications of here today is that there's somebody around that has seen all of this great things that are on the inside and yet they have not come to know the one who's truly the Savior. All right, second thing I want you to see here is both misunderstand Jesus. Both don't understand the mission of Jesus. They don't understand the death on a cross that's going to happen. And in fact, that's true about all of the disciples. All of the disciples envision Jesus to be the coming king who's going to be the one to reestablish Israel. They're looking for somebody very Davidic in nature, and they look back to David when, you know, Israel was on the map. I mean, Israel was somebody to contend with, and they're going, the new Messiah is going to do that. He, he, he's going to be a nationalistic figure. You know, it, it, to put it in, in vernacular, we can understand, he's going to make Israel great again, right? I mean, that's what he's doing. That's his, that's his main charge of what he's about is he's going to put us back on the map. For Peter, he feels like his job is to protect Jesus because he's listened carefully and he knows that there are individuals that are going to come against Jesus. And so Peter's motive right now and what he misunderstands about Jesus is, no, Jesus is going to his own death. So he's going to stop that. He's going to stop people from harming Jesus. And he's saying, I'm the figure that's going to step in and be bigger than life and protect Jesus. What about Judas, on the other hand? His motives are perhaps a little less clear. Judas is one who's going to completely sell out. He's going to uh, give up, and he's going to give Jesus over to the Pharisees. He's going to take money in order to be able to do that. But what is it really about Judas that allows him to lose heart and to give up on this band of people that he's been with and this Messiah who he has been following? Well, there's three potential uh, motives that he might have had. And by the way, I, I don't think the scriptures are entirely clear on this. We're just trying to piece together things that we know about Judas and we know about the historical context. And so these are possibilities. And again, they're not my ideas. I've read these this week, so I'm just disclosing those to you. But this is what's ticking perhaps on the inside of Judas. The first one is financial. We already know there's good indication that he's greedy. And all he sees is, hey, a dead Messiah is not getting me anywhere. And if that's Jesus' path is to go basically you know, to, to his own death, I'd rather turn him over for some money right now. And, and it's like a business proposition. This is just better for me. And so economics might have been something employed here. It might have also been something political. And he is likely from a group of people that were in, individuals who are extremists and trying to get to overthrow Rome. And when he figures out that Jesus is not about overthrowing Rome, in fact, I don't really know what he's about, but he's not about getting a big insurrection going so that we can take on the Romans and kick them out. And when he realizes eh, Jesus is not really about that, then he no longer has use for Jesus. That would be the political theory. There's one more theory, and it would be the one that I call the guardian theory. 
and this is kind of the opposite of really the political theory. It's that he's in, he's in bed with the Pharisees. He understands what the Pharisees want. The Pharisees want to retain their own power. And with Jesus rocking the boat this much, Rome's liable to come in and just crack down and really take back over again with an iron fist and cause a lot of harm to people, but also really harm the Pharisees who are the ones that are in power right now. So really, he's acting more like a guardian to keep something bigger like that happening. Now, I will say I don't really find a lot of credit in number three. I think it was more like number one, he's greedy, or number two, he really is seeing Jesus is not going far enough politically. But we don't really know. We don't really know what's on the inside of Judas. Here's what we do know, that both of them have wrong views of Jesus. Both of them miss who he is. Both of them don't anticipate that he's going to go to a death on a cross and rise again. There's no way that they could know that. And so on the inside of them, they don't really understand Jesus and what he is all about. All right, number three that I think I want you to see of their similarities and differences, both of them are called out. And by called out, I mean that Jesus confronts them. Jesus has never been a wallflower that's afraid to confront people. Jesus is one who confronts them and is going to tell them that what they've done is wrong or what they've said is wrong. I got called out this week. It was kind of a little strange thing that happened. It was Friday night right before bed. Denise had gone to bed. I was on my way there. And I had been texting a little bit earlier with the staff about the Mariners game. Well, I was going to text Denise and tell her, hey, there is some, I know you're going to do some grocery shopping tomorrow. There's some deodorant that I need. It's Speed Stick, and it's on sale. I'd like for you to buy me five of those. So I text that to Denise, and I go to bed, and I get up the next morning, and I realize that I've accidentally sent that message to the staff. They respond, what, what, question mark? You sent a message to the staff, there's one of us that need a little help with some deodorant? What are you saying here? Oops, wrong thread. <laughs> Jesus is going to call out Judas and Peter. The story goes on that there's a traitor in the midst and everybody's stunned. Peter is still smarting from his previous comments about washing my feet. So he's kind of afraid to say anything at this moment. So he actually tells John, he whispers to him. In fact, back to what the scriptures say, whispers to him, ask him who? And John goes, oh, okay, all right. Who is it, Jesus? And so, you know, there they are having the meal and they are going to be asking him who is the one that is uh, the, the one that's the, the betrayed you. Most of us don't really realize this, but they ate that night, and they ate in a reclined position. Uh, it was a spot where they s s laid down really around the table. It's called a triclinium meal. It's what Greeks and Romans used to do, and I've got a picture of it here. That's more or less what they were doing. And so you can tell John all the way over to the, the far right leaned back to Jesus and said, who is it, Jesus? And so Jesus, you know, it says, well, basically, I'm going to tell you who it is, and I'm going to do it by dipping my hand in the, in the, with bread into the dish and then handing that to the disciple that's the traitor. He does that, hands it directly to Judas Iscariot, and he says to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. Everybody's like, they're so confused. Jesus has finally handled the morsel to the person. He's taken it. Jesus said something cryptic. And they're going like, what does he mean by that? Does he mean Judas is supposed to go buy some more stuff or give some stuff to the poor? We, we're, we're confused here. Judas knows he's been called out. Judas, Judas has had the finger put on him. So he's beginning to go, man, it's really uncomfortable. I did not see that coming tonight. How could Jesus even know that I had gone to the Pharisees? And so he's like, peace out. I'm I'm gone. And so he steps out that night at that moment. John is constantly, as the writer John, is one who is constantly working with issues of light and dark. And I don't want this to pass by you because the moment that Judas leaves the room, he says something very interesting in the text. He says, and it was night. What's he telling us with that? He's saying, Judas literally stepped into the night. He stepped out of the light and stepped into the night. And he's in, he's in 
companionship with the devil at this moment and further falling into the arms of the devil with each movement that he takes. And he's the darkness that has actually just left the group. But lest you think that that was the only failure that night, no, Peter has a failure almost as big. And Peter says, you know what? I'm never going to let you die, Jesus. I will give my life for you before I let anybody take your life. Oh, Peter, Peter, don't you know you are going to deny me three times before the cock even crows in the morning? And the scriptures tell us that, that he has three times he denies. As Jesus is being scourged, as Jesus is being interrogated, their people are saying, hey, Peter, you're with Jesus, right? Oh, no, not me. You're Galilean. That's from the region where Jesus has been ministering. Oh, no, not me. In fact, one of the gospel writers even says that he cusses. Blankety blank blank, not me. And so he is so adamant to say, it is not me. And Jesus calls out both men, the traitor and the denier that night, and says, I don't believe the words you're saying, and I'm calling you out for your wronghood. Fourth, both men are overestimating themselves. Both think too highly of themselves, and they don't really know Jesus well. This is a common problem. We accurately, we have problems in, problems in accurately oftentimes assessing things around us. Let me give you a good example of that. When it comes to risk, we have the tendency to overestimate uncommon risks and underestimate common risks. Uh, one of the seminal figures in risk management is a guy named Peter Slavic, and he's found that people typically overestimate the risk of dying from homicide or natural disaster, and they underestimate the likelihood of dying from diabetes, cancer, or stroke. And so that's the way we're made up, is that we're not very good at evaluating things around us. We overestimate things and underestimate others, or people even might, out of ignorance, make some decisions. The iconic example is the, the elderly man who once was a good driver, but he's not anymore. But he says to his family, no, 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 I'm still a great driver, but he's, you know, he's manic on the roads, and he's, he's a terrible driver, and his keys should be taken away from him. He's not very good at that moment of evaluating really where he is. For Judas, he thinks Jesus is failing at least his master plan, and so he's willing to sell Judas, Jesus out. The ultimate set of betrayal is found at the upper room where uh, Jesus, they, they leave and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane and that is where Judas is going to have all of his uh, forces allied so that he can bring in the Pharisees and they can arrest Jesus at that moment. There is a very famous set of paintings about the, 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 the point of the betrayal of, of Jesus. And one of my favorite ones is by a, an Italian author named Giotto. And this is at a, uh, it's a fresco, and it's painted on a wall in a church in, in northern Italy. And I love the painting because it has such detail to it. You can notice all the people there with torches and all the people there that are military leaders. You can notice the disciples off to the side. Peter's even over here cutting off the, the, uh, the ear of the, the, the servant. And there is... In the middle of the whole scene is, is Judas that's come to betray Jesus, and of all things, with a kiss. The person that's closest to you is oftentimes the one that can hurt you the most. And Judas, at that moment, is the one who has come, and he's overestimated himself, and he's underestimated, really, who Jesus is. Peter, likewise, Peter is one who thinks that Jesus needs his protection. Little does he know, he needs Jesus' protection. It's not going to be his life given for Jesus. It's the other way around. Jesus' life is going to be given for him. But he has an overestimation of himself and doesn't understand his own weakness at that moment. Fifth and finally, and maybe this is the most important thing I'm going to say all day to you. Fifth and finally, Peter repents and Judas never does. I love what Kathleen Norris writes. She says, repentance, if you give me the next slide, Repentance is not a popular word these days, but I believe that any of us recognize it when it strikes us in the gut. Repentance is not coming to our repentance is coming to our senses, seeing suddenly 
what we've done that we might not have done, or recognizing that the problem is not with what we do, but in what we have become. And so repentance is this important moment in which you understand with clarity what you've said, what you've done, the actions you've taken, and how wrong they are. And there's a sense of sorrow that overtakes us, and Peter has that. Peter wishes he could take back the words that night. He wishes he was not so weak and in that moment, and, and, and he wishes he could take that back. But of course, he is the one who comes, and Jesus is going to be the one who, after his resurrection, comes and restores Peter. He confronts him, hey, you remember what happened? And do you love me now? Yes, I do, Jesus, and you know all about me. And Jesus restores him that, at that moment. And his humble heart is what allows Jesus to give, even give him a special place within the church as it's being formed. Not so much with Judas. Judas never repents. Judas has a hard heart through the entire uh, course of this whole narrative. And here's something interesting. The scriptures say that on the lips of almost all of the disciples is Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is Lord. Do you know those words never hit the lips of Judas Iscariot? He's always this guy that's just around, but he's never the one that's affirming the position, the rightful position of Jesus. Judas hopes that he would have a conquering deliverer. That's not Jesus. And so he is willingly going to sell him out. Judas never exercises saving faith, and therefore Judas never really repents. Let me see if I can bring this home to you in a, a modern-day example. And I want to do it using Gordon Ramsay and the show Kitchen Nightmares. Now, I can honestly say I've never watched a complete season of this, but I've gotten glimpses of it, maybe an episode here or there, and here's the theme of the, sh of the show. There's some restaurant owner that knows that they're in trouble. They've got a great location. They've got a great setting. They, they, they're, everything's on full gas. Only one problem, they've run out of clients. Nobody's coming to their restaurant anymore. And so Gordon Ramsay is called in, and Gordon Ramsay is the no-nonsense guy. He's going to give you a dose of reality. And so one of the first things that Gordon Ramsay always does is he orders about six or eight things off of the menu, has all the people make that and then bring it to him because the problem each episode is almost always the same. The food is terrible. And so he tastes about six or eight of the dishes, and with each one, he carves them up giving everybody a dose of reality and telling them why the food was met, not made properly and doesn't taste good. And what he wants to have arrive to the people is the oh no moment, like, oh no, we have got to change or this restaurant is going down. Now again, the manager usually or the owner of the restaurant, they have some inkling that there's something that's wrong, but they usually find themselves overwhelmed with all kinds of other stuff. They have the staff that they have to take care of. They've got schedules that they've got to do. They're distracted by all the things that are the orders that are coming in, things that have to happen in the kitchen. They even find time to go out and greet guests as they come, all the while making stinky food. And the stinky food's the problem. That is what Gordon Ramsay does as he comes in and about usually halfway through the episode, people start to get clarity. If we don't change, there's going to be a problem here. Here's what I want you to hear. Peter understands that, ultimately. Judas never does. Judas never has the oh no moment. He never has the moment in which he says, everything Jesus is telling me is true, and I have to repent. Here's what we've learned today. Two men in the upper room that night had a failure of faith. One, it's going to be, again, a minor blip. The other is going to be destruction and eternal tragedy. And, of course, the one who ended with, well, somewhat of an upbeat side, ultimately, is Peter. After the resurrection, of course, he is sorrowful and he is restored. Jesus, of course, gives him a special position. Judas, on the other hand, goes out after this whole episode and he hangs himself. And that's so many times what Satan does when he gets a hold of somebody is he destroys them. And that's what is going on inside of Judas. Repentance is available to all of us. 
And it's something that we all desperately need. I want to end with the story. The story is from a man named Leslie Newbegin. He was a missionary in India for years. And he tells the story of going to a village, and uh, the village knew that he was coming, and he was a guest that was going to be honored in his arrival. He was a missionary at that time, and they liked him. They loved him for the gospel that he brought to them. He said there was a way to get to the village. There were no roads that got there, and you came by a river, and so you could enter from the river either on the north side of the village or the south side of the village. All the village was anticipating him to come by the south entrance into the village, and he said like no other Indian group could do, this group that was in the Madras region, they said it, it was full tilt. They were going to come out with singing. They were going to come out with instruments. They are going to come out with fresh fruit, juices, even a, even a dance that they did that was special for guests that arrived. And so he said, I was all ready for that. They were all ready for that. And then I came to the wrong side of the village. There on the north, I had stepped in on the south. So they, you know, all I said was I saw some chickens and pigs, and they, you know, that wasn't going to help. So he said, uh, all of a sudden, they send word, and everybody that's on the north side of the camp comes to the south where he is. He says, it was as if the village had done a gigantic U-turn. He said, I stayed back and waited for them to get all ready, and then appeared, and he said, the party went on. Newbegin says, this is what I want you to hear about repentance about metanoia, which is the Greek word, which means to repent. He says, the reign, the reign of God has drawn near, but you can't see it because you're looking the wrong way. You need a change in orientation. You are expecting the wrong things. You think you see God, but you don't. You have to be, as Paul says, transformed by the renewing of your mind you have to go through a mental revolution. Otherwise, the reign of God will be totally hidden from you. And you think about how many times Jesus talked in parables. How many times he did things that were a mask to people at times. And it was the ones that really wanted to have that reorientation, the ones that wanted their minds to be renewed, that God came to and ushered in the reign of Jesus within their lives. Here's what we know. Repentance was available to both of them. Peter took advantage of it. Judas never did. What about us? Are we a people who are a repenting people? Are we a people who actively want to know God, who want to be corrected by God, who want to be formed by God? The story today is urging us to be that brand of people that says, I'm not going to rely upon my own devices. I'm going to listen to what God has to say, and I'm going to be obedient to that. Let your story be one of repentance and restoration and not one that is a refusal of repentance. That always leads to the same spot. It leads to destruction. Let's pray. Father, in stark reality here, we see... Two men who both had a failure on the night in the upper room. One is restored, one's not. <laughs> Lord, we all in this room today know which side of the equation we want to be on. And what that takes, Lord, is just a humble and tender heart that says, correct my wrong. <laughs> David said it this way, Lord, find out if there be any wicked way in me. And we want to be people at the very core of our being that are saying, yes, Lord, do that cleansing work. Come and show us what's wrong and let us have hearts that are quick to obey. Thank you, Lord, for this reminder today. And thank you for your goodness to restore people who really want and need that. That's your nature as our redeeming and faithful God. We pray this in the name of Jesus.